Hi there. Okay. Uh, hi, it's my privilege and honor to introduce Ruth Musgrave. Uh, uh, so Ruth uh, did her honors with Luis Moresi at Monash. And I guess after finishing her honors, Luis convinced her that the right way forward is oceanography. Then uh, she went to Scripps Institution of Oceanography at San Diego and she did her PhD there. And she finished, I think, just a bit before I arrived there to do a postdoc. Then she went on for a postdoc at MIT Ocean Engineering School and afterwards at Wood School Oceanographic Institution. And uh, recently, six months ago, eight months ago, how, how long have you been there? Uh, uh, almost a year. <clears throat> almost a year. So oh, mm -hmm. well, COVID time flies. So and <laughs> recently she went to Canada in Dalhousie to start a faculty position. So since it's already after midnight there, I'll hand over to you. And uh, I'll, I want to make a note that tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Canberra time, I arranged a Zoom call with Ruth for anyone who wants to chat further on her research or on the talk or anything so that we don't go up to 2 a.m. in Canada tonight. OK, so I'll uh, send out an, a Zoom details uh, after the seminar. So, yeah, thank, thank you. And that includes uh, the student catch up that we often do after the seminar. So we're going to spare Ruth that too. And so they can join tomorrow if that's OK. Yeah, sure. Thank you. OK, uh, off you go. The stage is yours. Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you uh, for everyone to, to everyone for being here. Um, I'm very happy to be able to present my research um, at ANU from the comfort of my own home here in Canada. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about uh, some work that I've been doing recently uh, with my collaborators, uh, Jim Lursack and Dylan Winters at OSU, Oregon State University. And we've been thinking about internal tide energy pathways uh, at the coast. Um, oop, ah, advanced that way. Okay, so um, a brief talk overview. I'm going to uh, split the talk into three parts. I'm going to start with a really big picture view um, of ocean mixing and its role in climate, which kind of motivates all of this, all of this work. Um, we, we still see this, the title slide, is that right? Uh, how about now? No, I, st I, really? still, I still see this title. Yeah, it's still the title. Ah, that's interesting. Um, Perhaps on share and share. Again. Actually, I, I have a button here that says resume share. Ah, Sharing is paused. That's yeah. what you need to do. Go for it. Well, I've gone for it. Is it has that made a difference? You might have to refresh the... Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to start again. Okay, can you see my screen again? Yep. Okay, you see the next slide? Not yet. Ah. Sharing is pause, bring your shared window to the front. Try not to share just the, the keynote or the PowerPoint. I've seen troubles with this thing. Well, that is what I, I am only sharing now. Okay, we've got the overview. Let's go. Oh, you can see it now? Yep. Okay. All right, good. Um, so the overview, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to start big picture, explain the motivation, ocean mixing and its role in climate. Um, and then I'll zoom in a little bit and talk about internal tides in the open ocean, which um, arguably are better studied. Um, and then I'm going to... Um, narrow down to my specific focus today, which is internal tides at the coast. So um, ocean mixing, you can see the next slide now, can't you? Okay, good. Um, so let me just try and get everyone on the same page by explaining what I mean by turbulent mixing. Um, so um, imagine for a moment that the ocean uh, only has two layers. It has a, a very light, warm layer that floats above a, a much deeper, uh, dense, uh, a, a dense layer, a cold, dense layer below. Um, and, and so that's what I'm indicating here at the left with this light, this light blue above and the dark blue below. If I was to 
a parser profiler from the top to the bottom, you would see uh, something like what you can see in the bottom left corner here, uh, uh, less dense and then, and then more dense with a sharp interface in between. Now, uh, let's say we add some mixing. So we add some turbulence to this. Um, well, what that mixing is going to do is it's going to uh, generate, it's going to create an intermediate uh, density class. Uh, it's going to mix the, the upper and the lower layer and create uh, an intermediate density. Um, and so now if I pass my profiler through here, you'll see um, a slightly reduced gradient. And so if I keep on doing this, I keep on mixing, uh, I keep on creating these intermediate layers and I'm reducing the gradient uh, uh, between the, the uh, light, uh, the light fluid at the surface and the, the dense fluid at the bottom. And if I, if I let this thing run to the end, um, then what I'll do is homogenize the entire fluid. Uh, so there is no density gradient whatsoever. Um, and so what turbulent mixing has done here is reduced gradients. And as a physical oceanographer, I'm particularly, particularly interested in density gradients because they're very dynamically important. Um, obviously this also has uh, consequences for chemical and biological gradients in the ocean. Um, from a physics point of view, uh, what mixing has done is it's raised the potential energy of the fluid. And so you can see this, if you consider the uh, position of the center of mass of the fluid, um, in the stratified fluid, the center of mass is ever so slightly below the, the center of the, um, the center of the depth. Um, and as we mix the fluid, the center of mass uh, is, is raised until it's in the center of the fluid. Um, and so the potential energy of the final system is, um, is, uh, is more than it was um, in its initial stratified state. So conservation of energy requires that um, mixing requires a source of energy, it requires a source of mechanical energy. And in the ocean that tends to come um, from the winds and the tides. So um, why do we care about mixing? Um, well, it's, it's obviously, it's a fundamental ocean process. Um, it happens, uh, the ocean, has an extremely large Reynolds number, 10 to the eight. So it is turbulent um, and, and mixing is occurring everywhere um, on relatively small scales, scales of, uh, of tens of meters, I would say, but it is ubiquitous. Um, and as a result, it has um, influence on climate. And so, um, well, uh, what, I'm, what I'm gonna show here is how, um, is how turbulent mixing plays a role in global climate um, using this schematic from uh, Lynn Talley, 2013. And, and so what she's done here, she's, uh, she's split the ocean um, into uh, three ocean basins. So these are the boxes here, the Indian, the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, and then the Southern Ocean with the, um, the Antarctic circumpolar current going around uh, Antarctica. Um, and then all of these arrows and colors, these indicate the flow of water between each of the ocean basins. Um, and you don't need to worry too much about the water masses that are labeled Atlantic bottom water, etc. Just that water uh, does pass uh, through each of the ocean, ocean basins in this large scale overturning circulation. And so um, conceptually, I like to think of this, um, I'm a simple kind of person, um, so I like to think of this in um, three parts. Um, and so the, the, the first part is the formation of, uh, of deep waters at high latitudes. And so this occurs um, uh, due to cooling in the winter at high latitudes when um, the ocean loses a lot of heat at its surface and it forms a dense fluid, the densest fluid in the ocean that sinks to the bottom. Um, and it forms the, the, the densest water masses, the uh, um, Atlantic Boston water and the North Atlantic deep water. Um, deep water formation only occurs in the Southern Ocean in, a, in the North Atlantic. Um, now, once that deep water has formed, there are two ways by which that water can be returned to the surface. So intermediate depth waters can be uh, drawn back up to the surface without a change in their internal energy um, through the action of wind stress uh, in the Southern Ocean. Um, and this happens because these isopycnals outcrop in the Southern Ocean. And so they can essentially slide up an isopycnal um, simply through the action of wind stress without having to change their density. Um, and so that, that accounts for the, the, um, the shallow cell of the overturning circulation. Um, and, and that's uh, essentially determined by wind stress. The, the rate at which that overturning occurs is determined by wind stress. However, the deepest waters really rely on turbulent mixing to return to the surface. There, there are no um, 
shared isopycnals with those deeper with that deepest water at the surface, and the only mechanism by which they can return to the surface is by turbulent mixing. So um, this has implications when we come to um, when we come to try and project how ocean circulation will change in the future using numerical models. The problem is that turbulence occurs at small scales, so as I said, tens of meters. Um, and when we uh, model climate, we tend to do it at very large scales because we want to run simulations for hundreds of years. Um, and we want to couple both atmosphere and ocean together. So I, I believe that the IPCC uh, class of global uh, climate models are, are, are at scales of around about one degree, so of order 100 kilometers. Um, and so it's impossible to represent, or it's impossible to model um, turbulent processes in these models, and it, it kind of will be for the foreseeable future. Um, so it's necessary to represent the impact of turbulent mixing in these models. Um, and so this kind of leads to this cottage industry of trying to develop parameterizations, physically based parameterizations for when and where turbulence mixing occurs, turbulent mixing occurs in the ocean. Um, and so that, that's really um, the main motivation, um, for me at least, for trying to understand um, when and where uh, mixing is happening in the ocean. Now there are uh, a, a, a number of different processes that lead to mixing. Um, but essentially the source of energy for mixing um, comes from either the winds or the tides. So this schematic comes from um, an article by uh, McKinnon in 2013. In the, on the left side of the um, schematic, you can see um, the wind, the wind associated processes. So the winds blow over the surface of the ocean and uh, for the purposes of mixing, they do two things. They generate uh, wind generated internal waves which can propagate down into the interior of the ocean where they can then break and mix. Um, and the winds also set in motion the general circulation, um, the low frequency flows and the, the deep currents that can interact with topography and generate lee waves. Those lee waves can, um, can lead to turbulence um, and, and mixing close to the bottom of the ocean. The tides also um, um, can lead to mixing um, and the tides, uh, the tides uh, dissipate around about one terawatt of energy in the ocean, which is comparable to the work done by the winds on the ocean. So each of these, um, each of these processes is equally important um, in, in um, dissipating energy in the ocean and potentially leading to mixing. Um, so the tides, um, which is the focus um, of, of uh, what I'm gonna talk about here, the tides generate internal tides. So these are internal waves at tidal frequencies that can, um, that can propagate energy elsewhere through the ocean um, and they can uh, lead to mixing. And so the energy pathway um, that, that um, I think is, is understood for the tides is that the surface tide, the tide that we're most familiar with that we see when we go to the beach and we see the surface of the ocean advance and, and recede uh, twice a day or once a day, depending on where you are, that tide, the energy for that tide, the, the surface tide or the barotrophic tide, um, comes from the, the uh, energy in the, in the astronomical configuration of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. Um, that energy is then transferred into internal motions in the internal tides. Um, and and, and it, the internal tides then uh, transfer that energy to, um, throughout the ocean basin before they break and mix. Um, and, and lead to dissipation, um, um, lead to ultimately the dissipation to, to heat of that, um, of that energy. And so the first step in this pathway is understanding uh, where the barotropic tide is losing energy. Um, and we, we have maps of this. Um, so these uh, maps were created by um, Egbert and Ray in 2003. And what they did, um, They've used alt altimetric measurements um, constrained to um, a simple model um, to examine where the barotropic tide is losing energy in the ocean for two major tidal constituents, the semi-diurnal M2 and the diurnal K1. And where you're seeing red, this is where the barotropic tide uh, is losing energy. Um, overall, they found that the, the barotropic tide uh, loses energy at a rate of 3.5 terawatts in the ocean. Um, and of that, 2.5 terawatts is dissipated in the shallow seas and one terawatt is dissipated in the deep ocean. Um, 
And so just uh, looking for a moment at uh, only the semi-diurnal constituent, you can see that there's a significant loss of energy over these features um, that turned out to be correlated with topography um, in the deep ocean. So this is Hawaii, this is the Mariana Ridge, this is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. Um, and, and what's happening here is that the barotropic tide is uh, converting its energy into internal tides uh, that, can, that can transfer the energy away. Now, um, it's a little bit more complicated than this because actually the, the exact nature of, um, of the internal response of the ocean to that barotropic forcing depends on the frequency of the forcing. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk about the tide being sub-inertial or super-inertial. When the tide is sub-inertial, it has a, a relatively low frequency compared to the local Coriolis frequency. So these are low-frequency tides. So the diurnal tide, which is once per day, is sub-inertial uh, everywhere polewards of 30 degrees. Um, the semi-diurnal tide is only sub-inertial polewards of about 74 degrees. Um, and the response of the ocean to sub-inertial forcing is very different compared to when it's super-inertial. Um, and so when it's super-inertial, these are relatively high-frequency tides. The semi-diurnal tide is super-inertial over much of the ocean basin. And the response, um, the, the dissipation, or sorry, I should say the loss of energy from barotropic tide um, is mediated by the physics um, that arises from super-inertial super um, interactions of a stratified fluid uh, with topography. And so um, to understand what that looks like, um, I'm going to show you the output of a numerical model. Um, and so what, what this model um, has done, uh, this was run by Simmons et al. in 2004, they took a global, um, a, a, a global model um, and they um, imposed a uniform stratification everywhere. So this is stratified fluid um, and they applied um, a, a tidal forcing. Um, and then they looked at the interior response of the model. And so what you're seeing here in red and blue is the inter interface displacement, I, I think at around about 100 meters or so, um, after two days of, of the simulation. And, and what you can see around these regions that, um, that came up in the maps of barotropic tidal loss, um, you, can, you can see the generation of these internal tides, these waves radiating away with small scales. After six days, these, um, these tides have really uh, radiated long distances um, expand, uh, transferring energy from their generation sites um, throughout the, the ocean basins. And after 20 days, you can see that um, in this very idealized global simulation, the uh, entire um, ocean is full of internal tide energy. Um, to get a sense of what this looks like um, under the water for, um, for those that don't um, don't necessarily research this and see it every day. This is another simulation. Um, this is one that I ran. And so this is now looking at a cross section um, of, uh, of tidal flow over a, a two dimensional ridge. This was actually configured for the Mendocino Ridge, but the physics is fairly applicable anywhere that you have uh, cross ridge tidal flows. Um, and so what you're looking at here, the black lines are isopycnals. Um, and the colors are the currents. Um, they're actually the baroclinic currents. Which, so I, I've subtracted the depth mean to isolate the internal tide response. And there are a couple of things to see here. The first is um, most of the energy, um, it, the, most of the energy um, that is being extracted from the, the tide, that I'm, the barotropic tide here, is being converted into an internal tide that propagates away from the ridge. And so, um, you can see the formation, these are internal tide beams, internal waves, the phase is propagating down, the group energy is radiating outwards. So it's, it's radiating outwards to the right and to the left of the screen. Um, there's also some local dissipation here, so you can see how these internal waves can break. Um, it, at this, in this particular location, things become very nonlinear, the waves become, the, the isopycnal displacements become very steep. And they overturn much like um, much like uh, breakers at the beach when you see um, when you see waves uh, shoaling at the beach. Now, the nice thing about super inertial internal tides is that um, well, they um, they are of a class of waves called uh, 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 inertia gravity waves, um, freely 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 propagating inertia gravity waves. And they have some very nice uh, properties that make them very easy to work with. Um, they're, they're analytically uh, 
quite tractable. And I'm going to go through this on the next slide um, uh, with a little bit of mathematics. It's, it's just one slide, um, but I, I do think it's helpful um, to compare the response when we have uh, subinertial tides over coasts um, so that you can kind of see how these two things are different side by side. Um, and so the, the theory is, is pretty straightforward. We start with a linearized set of equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, um, and we assume that the solutions are wave-like. They're periodic in X. They have a frequency that is equal to the tide, the forcing frequency, and they have some unknown structure in Z and we can combine um, the governing equations to form a single wave equation, a field equation. Um, and then essentially, um, so this is for the vertical velocity component W. Um, we say quite reasonably over flat bathymetry, the vertical velocity should be zero at the bottom of the ocean and zero at the top of the ocean. Um, and so if we impose that as boundary conditions, um, hopefully you can see that um, if we assume that n squared, the stratification is constant with depth, solutions to this are simply sines, um, sinusoids, um, they're, they're, they're just sines. And, and so um, when we allow n squared to be a function of depth, um, then we can solve this equation uh, numerically, um, but it's still, it's just an eigenmode equation. Um, and so here's an example of a solution um, here. So I've taken a stratification, uh, uh, stratification profile from just off the Oregon shelf. And I've um, solved this system of equations, um, this or this equation with this boundary condition. And this is what the modes look like. Um, so the takeaway point here is that um, the modes are uh, only in the vertical over a flat bottom. Um, and uh, they're increasingly complex for higher modes. So mode one um, is um, uh, the just the, the first sinusoid and, and mode two is um, has an extra crossover. Uh, mode three has two cross two crossing points um, at zero. There's a dispersion relation as you might anticipate for a wave problem. Um, the dispersion relation relates um, in order for these uh, the, the fluid motion to uh, satisfy uh, this motion um, described by the modes, the wave number and the frequency have to be related uh, by this dispersion relation here. And this is what it looks like. I draw your attention to it because I'm going to show you more dispersion curves later and these will appear. Um, but essentially, um, the, the, the dispersion curve is, is kind of parabolic. You'll notice that these waves can't exist at sub-inertial frequencies. So this dashed line here, this is where omega is equal to f. Um, so these waves are constrained to exist only um, at, at relatively high frequencies for super-inertial frequencies. So, um, so that uh, accounts for that, that, that very simple theory actually quite well describes um, the generation of internal tides uh, where the tidal frequency is super inertial. So that's for the semi diurnal constituent over much of the ocean and where the ocean floor is largely flat. So um, once you get away from Hawaii and once you get away from the Mariana Ridge, um, the ocean floor is largely flat, and that, uh, that theory well describes the propagation of these waves. Um, however, um, in shallow seas, where we actually have most of the, the loss of energy from barotropic tide, um, the ocean floor is far from flat. Um, and furthermore, um, the diurnal tide, as I mentioned before, above 30 degrees north or below 30 degrees south is sub-inertial. Um, and so that, that um, those wave dynamics don't apply there. And so actually a different wave dynamics applies. And so to get at those, um, those wave dynamics, um, we have to solve, um, essentially it's the same equations as before, but now our boundary conditions are different. So we're gonna apply a boundary condition of no flow um, along this sloping profile. So this profile represents the shelf break. Um, and in doing this, um, we are no longer able to separate the horizontal and the vertical components of the motion so that the, the, the two dimensions become coupled. Um, the methods for solving this, I mean, it's, it's just a linear problem. The, the computational method is slightly different. Um, and the way that I'm presenting it here, this is a resonance scan. Um, and essentially what you're looking at here is a dispersion relation. So we have frequency on this axis and wave number on this axis. Um, where there are gray lines. So this is a pretty noisy plot um, for, for computational reasons. Um, but where there are gray lines, this is where there are resonances in this domain. And so this is where the, the modes exist. 
And so the first modes that I want to draw your attention to, um, I've highlighted with these blue lines here, these are the, the um, freely propagating um, inertia gravity waves that I was talking about before. So these are at super inertial frequencies and they do appear in this scan. Um, however, there is an extra set of waves that I'm gonna um, focus on now. Um, these are the coastal trap waves and they exist only um, because of the presence of the boundary. Um, this bathymetric boundary supports them. And so what's interesting about these waves is that they can exist at both sub-inertial and at super-inertial frequencies. Um, they only exist along coasts. Um, when they are sub-inertial, they are completely trapped, so all of the energy is confined to the coast. However, when they become super-inertial, they are able to exchange energy with the ocean, uh, with the internal uh, waves in the ocean's interior, and they're actually coupled um, to, these, uh, to these freely propagating inertial gravity waves. Um, so let me um, show you the structure of what these waves look like, at least uh, in the sub-inertial case, um, just to, to give you a sense of what they are. Um, and so um, here's this bathymetry, and I, I've solved that, that set of equations uh, using a, a linear numerical model. Um, and uh, these are what the modes look like. So mode one uh, in the along shore velocity and the cross shore velocity Mode two, slightly more complex. Mode three, even more complex. Um, there's a couple of um, things that, I, that are important here. Um, so the, the currents associated with these um, modes have um, a structure that is largely barotropic, so largely depth uniform on the shelf. But once you move over to the shelf break and over the slope, they tend not to be barotropic. And um, this is the influence of stratification. Um, they tend to uh, acquire a baroclinic component and this is actually extremely inconvenient. So super inertial internal tides are baroclinic by definition over a flat bottom. That makes them very easy to work with, with observations and in models. All you need to do is subtract your depth mean, and then you're isolating your internal tides. And so there are whole frameworks for working with the energetics of these waves that can't work over the coast because the, the dynamics uh, couple barotropic and baroclinic motion. So, um, this is really just a, a practical issue. Um, it, it's, it's quite difficult to um, calculate energy transfers between modes um, uh, and scattering uh, of these modes explicitly in the same way that we do with super inertial tides in the open ocean. Um, uh, just to kind of drive that point home, if we look at the, um, the structure of the alongshore flux in these waves, so um, this is the cross shore distance here, and what I've done is I've, I've calculated the alongshore flux from these modes, mode one, mode two, and mode three. Um, the alongshore flux also has a, a fairly complicated structure. So if you um, go out and measure at one location, you won't really capture what the total flux is. The total flux is really the integral of the cross shore direction. Um, and the, as, I, as I mentioned before, the, the flux and the motion tends to be largely barotropic over the shelf, that's this region here. Once you reach the sloping region of the shelf break, um, then you start to um, acquire a baroclinic component. Um, and if you go off and you, you uh, only calculate the baroclinic flux um, from a mooring or from a model, then you will be severely underestimating the, the total flux of the wave. Um, and these are some estimates for this particular, uh, this particular case. So um, that's a little bit of theory and a little bit of background. So the question is, do we ever see these waves anywhere in the ocean? Um, and as I mentioned, it's hard, it's hard to, um, to really observe them. There, there have definitely been observations of sub-inertial um, internal tides, um, both at the Mendocino Ridge and um, other, other places, St Kilda in Northern Scotland, um, there has been evidence of these things. Super inertial trapped waves, much, much less so. However, there are numerical models, such as the one that I'm showing here, that suggest that um, these things might exist, even if they are hard to measure. So this is a numerical simulation um, of waves on the Tasman coast. Um, and what I've done here, um, this, um, this is, um, I forced it with uh, the barotropic tide at the boundaries, and I'm looking at the interior response. And what you're looking at in color here is um, are the, uh, vertical displacements um, of an isopycnal, of a given isopycnal. Um, and I've decomposed the time series um, to extract only the sub-inertial component here. So this is the K1 constituent here, and the super-inertial, the M2 constituent here. And then on the, on the far right, this is the full field. Um, so you can see these fully trapped uh, sub-inertial waves propagating up the coast. 
And what it was kind of surprising looking at this is that there is evidence of these uh, super inertial trapped waves also um, uh, propagating up the coast, um, at least in this region here. So the question that um, I'm going to try and, and get to with the last part of this talk is um, uh, under what circumstances uh, can, can we generate these waves, what conditions, um, and, and how likely is it that we, we expect to see them uh, in, in the real ocean. And so um, as with um, almost everything in this field, it's, someone has thought about this problem before, or at least a, a very uh, a very similar problem. Um, and so the similar problem is this, how in MISAC in 1973 considered um, a homogeneous, so an unstratified ocean, and the interaction of, um, uh, of a, an incident Poincaré wave that comes in towards the coast and reflects from the coast, and the coast has some corrugations in it um, that I'm indicating uh, with uh, Xe, which is a function of y, the along shelf distance. And what they found um, was that um, that, incident, um, that incident energy can scatter into Kelvin waves. So Kelvin waves are the allowable waves on a vertical in a homogeneous ocean along, um, uh, along a vertical wall with no, with no profile. Um, and essentially, um, so this is the, the set of equations that they solved. It, it looks uh, somewhat like this, the set of equations that I wrote down before. They're assuming uh, a pressure field, with it, which is a function of space and time. They decompose it into a spatial mode and, a, and they assume a solution that is, um, uh, has uh, the frequency of the incident, the incident wave. Um, and they come up with uh, a governing equation. The key part here is the boundary condition. So the boundary condition that they're imposing is that there's no flow through the boundary. Um, and so you can see well, let me uh, skip to the result and then I'll, I'll explain uh, how this comes about. And what they find, uh, which I, I actually think is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so what they find is that um, energy is scattered into um, a Kelvin wave and a long shelf propagating Kelvin wave when the incident Poincaré wave and the topographic scale satisfy this triad relation. And so, um, for those of you who are familiar with wave-wave wave interactions in the ocean, this is um, basically exactly the same thing that's going on here. Um, what's happening is that for wave-wave interactions, you have um, a nonlinear interaction um, that arises from the, the quadratic nonlinearity in the, in the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, and when um, and so if you have uh, two waves. Uh, in that quadratic nonlinearity, the, the exponents add together. And if the sum of the exponents uh, satisfies the dispersion curve um, of a free wave, then this, this acts as like a resonant forcing to the system of equations. Um, and so the analogous thing that's happening here, so we don't have any nonlinearities in the governing equation, but we have this um, apparent nonlinearity in the boundary condition. Um, and so we have a, a correlation between the um, the along shelf currents and the scales of the bathymetry. And so what's happening is the bathymetry is acting like, um, like a wave, like a stationary wave, a fixed wave. Um, and it can interact with the incident Poincaré wave such that energy is scattered uh, into, into um, a third wave. Um, and in this case, in the Howe and Mysac case, that, that was a Kelvin wave. So this gives us an indication of, of when we might expect this to happen in a stratified ocean. Um, when we have um, a, a real um, uh, cross-shelf profile. Um, and so that's what I'm going to explore with a series of simulations now that I want to show you. Um, and so uh, what we did here was we configured uh, the MIT GCM, a, a numerical model, um, so that we can, um, we can um, essentially shine an incident Poincaré wave uh, onto the coast. Um, and so we, we um, adjust the angle of incidence of the, of the Poincaré wave. So we adjust this angle theta um, and we adjust the corrugations, the length scale of the topography. Um, and essentially we're looking for some combination of the incident, the angle of incidence um, of the incident Poincaré wave with the topographic length scale such that energy is scattered into these, um, into these coastal trap waves. And so you'll notice um, as I change theta, I'm not changing the absolute wavelength of the incident wave, but I am changing the projection of that wavelength along the shelf. Um, and so in, in, in that sense, even for a fixed wavelength, I'm changing the, the 
apparent wavelength of the incident wave um, such that we might hit resonance. Um, and so here's a snapshot of what the flow looks like um, for, a, for a particular theta and a particular lambda topo that I chose. Um, and I think this is uh, surface U or surface V. It's, it's, it's one of the components of the velocity. Um, and so you can see that incident, the, the incident wave field is propagating down towards the shelf and then it reflects. There's the reflected Poincaré wave that you can see out here. But then something's happening over these corrugations. You can see the formation of these kind of smaller waves. And so it, this is a resonant case. And, and what we're seeing here is the form, formation of a scattered coastal trap wave. And so um, to measure, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this simulation um, a lot of times um, for a range of thesis and for a range of different uh, topographic length scales. And I'm going to look at how much energy um, is scattered into this coastal trap wave by measuring the flux um, just downstream um, to the right of the corrugations. So here's an example of what the flux looks like for this particular simulation. Here's the bathymetric profile. This is along this dashed line here. And this is the alongshore flux in uh, the barotropic and the baroclinic in the blue and the black. Um, and I'm just going to integrate the alongshore flux uh, over this region and I'm going to measure that. That's going to be my metric as to whether or not there's resonance for a range of theta and a range of lambda. And this is what I end up with. So um, this is for three different thetas. So theta is 20 degrees. So that means that it's, um, it's uh, very nearly, um, it's very nearly normal, normally incident. Um, and when theta is 60, it's, um, it's uh, more oblique. Um, and so when it's almost normally incident, um, we do actually see an increase in the, in the flux, um, in the along shelf flux uh, uh, at, uh, uh, when the topographic wavelength has scales of around about 280 kilometers. Um, I've normalized this along shelf flux by the incident flux. So this gives you a sense of, of how much energy we're talking about here. So it's, it's not tons, you know, 7%. Um, this is a very much a ballpark figure, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's not all of the energy by any stretch. It's not even most of it. Um, nevertheless, we are qualitatively seeing the behavior that we would expect from the Howe and Mysack theory. Um, so we see um, as the, the projected wavelength at the shelf um, decreases, um, so as we increase theta, that projected wavelength at the coast um, Incre uh, increases, sorry, decreases. Um, we see the resonant wavelength, the topographic wavelength uh, shifts to larger and larger scales. And this is consistent with this, uh, this triad relation. For reference, I've put the how and the how and MISAC predictions on here. Um, we wouldn't really expect them to match anyway, because they were working in a homogeneous ocean with a vertical wall. Um, but you can see how, um, how, uh, the qualitative behavior from their predictions is satisfied um, here as well. So this um, addresses how, um, how super inertial internal tides can be generated um, uh, by, uh, at the coast um, uh, by the scattering from an incident internal tide. Um, so what about sub inertial um, internal tides at the coast? So obviously you can't generate a sub inertial coastal trap wave um, from an incident Poincaré wave because those um, Poincaré waves can't exist um, at sub-inertial frequencies. Um, and so the only mechanism is um, scattering from um, a, a lower mode coastal trap wave, essentially a Kelvin wave in this case. So um, this is something, uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm forcing the model towards something like um, the Gravis Kelvin wave, um, which is um, you know, something like the tide that propagates along the coast. And um, so I force it towards that and I let that wave propagate out of the domain and then it interacts um, with this region of um, topography. So in this problem, I can't, the, there's no angle to change. Um, the only parameter that I can change here is um, the length scale of the topography. And, um, and, and then we can assess how much energy is scattered into coastal trap waves, um, depending on the length scale of this topography. Um, for a given incident Kelvin wave at a certain frequency. Um, and so again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to calculate the flux just downstream of the topography, um, and I'm going to um, integrate it um, uh, over some region. And it, for this, I'm only looking at the baroclinic component of the alongshore flux because it's very difficult to separate the barotropic component from the forcing wave itself, which has a large barotropic component. So this 
kind of goes back to this issue of how um, it, it can be hard to do energetics with these waves. Um, but anyway, if I do this, um, uh, I, I do it for a range of topographic wavelengths. And indeed, um, we do see um, a peak in the along shelf flux at a certain topographic wavelength. And again, it seems to be largely in agreement with the Howe and Lysak prediction, um, which is that um, uh, when K topo, when the wave, the wave number of topography uh, is close to the wave number of the coastal trap wave, um, this is where we see this resonance. And, and, and it's basically because the uh, wave number of the generating Kelvin wave um, is uh, very close to zero, it has very large scales. So um, there's two mechanisms in an idealized model as to, as to how you can generate these things. Whether this um, happens uh, in the real ocean is, is still um, an open question, but I can explore a little bit more deeply uh, with uh, realistic bathymetry. Um, and so um, that's what I'm going to show you next. So um, at real coasts, well, I'm going to construct my real coast by taking uh, something like the west coast of the United States, and I, I take the 500 meter isobath, um, and so that's what I've plotted here. It's a function of, uh, this is uh, longitude and latitude. And then I high pass it, um, and I calculate the distances. And so this is what the coast looks like by the time I've done this. Um, this was actually a pretty interesting exercise for me. Um, I didn't, it, it wasn't obvious to me looking at this profile, um, how, how what the scales would be and how this would look. Um, but it is um, interesting to note that there are some definite scales. I, I haven't actually made a spectrum of this profile, but you can see that there are some definite scales here. So the along shelf corrugations do have scales of order 100, 100 kilometers or so. The amplitude of the corrugations, well, some are very large, you know, 100 kilometers, but most are uh, 20 kilometers or so. Um, and actually, once you get north of the Mendocino Ridge, it seems like the spectrum really changes it, um, and there are much smaller scales in there. Um, I'm sure that uh, some geophysicists would know uh, what sets the along, the along shelf scales here. Um, if anyone has any ideas, I would be really interested to hear them, because they're very important to this problem, um, as we will see. So what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to take my, my version of the, of the uh, west coast of the United States, um, and I'm going to put that in my model, and then I'm going to um, shine a bunch of uh, uh, incident Poincaré waves at the coast. Um, and I'm going to do it for a at a range of angles. And so these are some snapshots um, of the surface velocity uh, for one of these simulations. So I chose an incident angle of 20 degrees to show you here. Um, and so I, I have a kind of control run. It's a little bit difficult with this model because there is viscosity in the model. And so I wanted to, um, I, I have a control run where I don't have corrugations so that I can try and um, back out what the influence of the corrugations are. And so um, here's a snapshot. So with corrugations, you can see that the large scale pattern, this is from the incident and reflected waves. But along the coast, you can see um, things that look uh, somewhat reminiscent to the generation of coastal trap waves. Um, um, that at least they look uh, much like that from the, the idealized simulations that I showed you earlier. Um, but perhaps um, what is more striking is the generation of these stripes here. So these are, uh, these are um, small scale waves. And in fact, uh, these are leaky edge waves. Um, they've been discussed by Chapman in, in 1982. And clearly, this is another um, another um, phenomenon that the incident uh, the incident wave can scatter energy into um, are these edge waves. Um, and and interestingly, we also see the edge waves when there are no corrugations on the shelf as well. So they don't rely on the on the presence of these along shelf corrugations to generate the edge waves. Um, so. Um, to, to, summarize, so to summarize the output of these simulations, I, I, I run um, these at a range of incident, um, a range of incident angles. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's pretty hard to get at the energetics of these waves individually. So I, I've been doing it from a kind of bulk view. Um, so what I do is I calculate the incident flux um, in, in this region, and then I just calculate the total reflected flux. And if the total reflected flux um, is very much uh, less than the incident flux, then, well, there must be some energy being lost at the shelf. And so I'm, I'm comparing how much energy is lost at the shelf um, as a function of different incident angles. Um, and so that's, 
that's what you're seeing here. So the incident flux, as we um, increase the angle, the incident flux goes down, right? When the wave is, um, is normally incident, we have maximum flux um, incident in the shelf. When the wave is parallel to the coast, then we don't have any incident flux. Um, so that makes sense. The reflected flux, well, um, first of all, consider the case where we have no along shelf corrugations. That's this blue line here. If there was no viscosity whatsoever, then I would expect that this would have the same amplitude as the yellow line. Everything would just be reflected straight off the shelf. But obviously there are some other things going on in the model and we are losing energy over the shelf. Um, however, we are losing more energy when we have uh, these corrugations along the shelf. Um, so energy is um, being scattered to small scales, um, perhaps uh, uh, through the, the generation of these coastal trap waves. Um, and this is, um, Another way to see it, it's kind of consistent uh, with that, that figure on the left is that the, the, the mean kinetic energy um, over the shelf break is actually um, rather larger for, uh, for uh, closer to normally incident waves um, than compared to the smooth case. Um, and so energy is being scattered into motions um, over the shelf break um, and it's concentrating kin kinetic energy over the shelf break um, at these small scales, which can be a precursor to mixing. So these simulations um, are a little bit preliminary, but they do support the generation of these shelf waves and, and actually highlight uh, perhaps the importance of edge waves in addition to the coastal trap waves um, that, I, that I've been talking about. Okay, um, so, so that's all. I have two points for my summary. Um, so internal tides um, at the coast are, uh, are pretty different to internal tides in the open ocean. Um, and and the, they're, they're a little bit harder to work with. The reason is that the steep bathymetry that goes couples together barotropic and baroclinic motions. And so this is kind of um, a practical issue, but it does make it hard to separate the wave modes um, uh, over, over the, steep, the steep bathymetry. Um, energy is fluxed alongshore. It, it can't flux in any direction as it can in the open ocean. Um, and at super inertial frequencies, the, the uh, wave modes themselves are coupled to the, to the open ocean mode, so they can exchange energy backwards and forwards. Um, and then uh, second, we can, we, there, there are two mechanisms by which we can generate these, um, these uh, coastal trap waves. Um, at super inertial frequencies, they can be generated by scattering of an instant Poincare wave uh, off of a long shelf corrugations. Um, and at sub inertial, um, uh, oh, and then um, the, inc the, the uh, impact of a, an incident Kelvin wave with corrugation. So for example, the, the barotropic tide as it propagates around the ocean basin can also scatter into um, coastal trap waves at both sub and super inertial frequencies. Um, the final point is that um, it seems plausible that, that coastal trap waves could be uh, directly generated by astronomical forcing because they have a large barotropic component. So, that kind of canonical um, energy pathway of, uh, you know, uh, astronomical energy being transferred to the barotropic tide and then from the barotropic tide into internal tides uh, may not apply very well at the coast. Um, and so that is all that I have, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. And very much. There will be much applause, which you won't get to hear, sorry. Um, uh, so, Navid, you're on, you're on. I'll let you manage the questions if you'd like to. There's nothing yeah, sure. yet in the chat. But... Sure. You can, you know, people can un unmute and ask questions. I may, I may start with one. So I see the, uh, I don't see anything in the chat. So, so essentially here you showed yeah, uh, another mechanism for energy, for you know, for internal way, internal tides to be propagating or f generated outside this, you know, 30, 30 degrees, uh, um, you know, like cutoff that we we usually think of when we are thinking of uh, just generation of linear internal tides. Mm -hmm. So, and and uh, and what you are arguing also is that you know. If you are if you are close to the coast because of this uh, because of bathymetry and and you know the ability of the bathymetry to generate uh, modes even when you are uh, you know at uh, at latitudes that you wouldn't expect to see them, the barotropic tide will ge can generate internal tides there and then they can propagate down outside. 
So, yeah, they can't. So I, they don't have the freedom to propagate anywhere in the ocean. They can only propagate along the shelf. But um, but as they propagate along the shelf, they they can uh, lead to to dissipation. Uh, okay. I mean, they will dissipate, and they can lead to mixing um, uh, deep along the shelf break. Um, so, and then you you were uh, you were also saying, but now because these are not um, uh, purely baroclinic modes, it's very harder to distinguish when you're going out with a ship and you're measuring something. You don't, you cannot say, ah, uh, I'll take out my depth average of the flow and the rest is the baroclinic flow and that's, you know, whatever it's in the frequency of the tides or whatever tide I'm expecting to have here. So, so, but if you do your, you know, if you do your you know, somehow you can do your decomposition. Can you then project to these modes that you get out of the analysis and and the, and then see how much of the flow is, uh, you know, this uh, coastal internal tides? Component? Yeah. So I, I I think that 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 is the right way to do it. Um. And and you can you can formally do it. It is formally correct to do it. Um in the long wave limit. But unfortunately, um, for short waves, which um, we're, we're often talking about for, for uh, tides because they have uh, slightly higher frequencies, um, the, the modes aren't orthogonal, <laughs> oh. which means that you, you, can't, you can't really project um, directly onto the modes. Um, yeah. It's questionable. I mean, their modes, they're, they're solutions to the, to the, um, to the, Eigen mode problem, but they are not orthogonal. There's no orthogonality relation. Um, yeah, like the the bathymetry, it's like having a mean flow uh, somehow that mixes up everything together. Perhaps, perhaps we're getting into the nitty gritty now. Huh. I haven't thought of it as as being like a mean flow. Somehow, and you know, introduces no normality to the linear operator. But, but you know, perhaps I, we can talk about. Huh. Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. There are lots of analogies. Um, there are lots of analogies across um, in in wave behavior. I mean, this analogy between wave wave interaction and um, and and wave scattering, I find pretty pretty interesting, pretty deep. Yeah, yeah that was that was uh, interesting. So, yeah. Um, well, if there's no one else, I'll just ask a little bit about that um, tectonics question <laughs> that you raised about the, oh, yeah. the you know, basically I, I looked at that, I just thought it was young versus old, right? I mean, the very, very young seafloor north of the ridge. But I wonder, what is it that you, what is it that's the characteristic of that, um, uh, seafloor or the coastline or whatever it is that is that is uh, driving the mode you see. I mean, what would the the change in? I mean, what is it you're looking for? You're looking for a change in the the um, frequency content of the bathymetry going north south. Is that is that what it was? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess before I did it, I had no idea what the length scales, what length scales I should expect to see in the coastline. You know, what is the spectrum of the coastline? Um, and so when I when I did it, I can see that you know it does seem like there are some some predominant scales. I haven't I haven't made a spectrum like I said, but I bet you if I did, um, I'd see a peak at around about a hundred kilometers. Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> but there was like a, a sharp transition, right? Yeah. Like, you know, what, well, maybe is, that's what Luke, what, is this the U.S. Canada border there? What is that there? <laughs> I thought it was the fracture zone, right? It's the transition from the strike step motion to the subduction zones. Um, right. So that's kind of a, I mean, geologically, it sort of very, sort of stands out, but I, I guess I hadn't really thought that there would be some, you know, that hadn't thought to look for that particular signal. It's quite intriguing. Hmm. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. Okay. Yeah, just on your have... behalf, Ruth, as well. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Staying up late. Is it 1 a.m.? Um, uh, it is 1 a.m. Okay, so I think we should uh, remind everyone who's on, 
who who's interested in uh, any follow up or you know asking something totally different um, about tomorrow's discussion. Nine a.m. Um, and 9 I'll send out some Zoom details uh, shortly. Okay, that's excellent. I'm going to pause or stop the recording now. We'll put that up on the website and let you know where that is, Ruth. And I'll just thank, thank you, you once again. Thank you very much indeed. Well, okay, thank you. Ruth, have a nice thank evening.